I was going to do something on quotes as part of my series on science and the media, and I was particularly keen on showing a few tricks of the trade by which people can be misquoted. I wasn't quite sure how much you all knew about this already, but then two almost identical claims dropped into my message box, which made it clear that maybe these techniques aren't well understood, because the people who messaged me swore that Ben Santa, lead author of a chapter in an IPCC report in 1995, had admitted to deleting a crucial part of the report that said humans were not responsible for recent climate change. The admission came, they told me, in an interview on the Jesse Ventura conspiracy show. But it's funny because after they gave me the link, I watched exactly the same interview and saw no such admission. Here's the clip. Lord Monckton points to deletions from the chapter, and there were deletions from the chapter. Uh, to be consistent with the other chapters, we dropped the summary at the end. Now how can we all watch the same thing and come away with a completely different understanding of what was said? Well, welcome to the wonderful world of television. After ten years of experiment, television, first shown to the public at the World's Fair, now takes its place as a new American art and industry. I guess I saw things differently because I've conducted scores of interviews for television, so when I watch an interview now, I'm not just listening to what's said, I'm looking to see where the cuts are made and where the cameras are positioned. And it's these insights I want to share with you. But television is just one journalistic medium, so let's start with the medium I started in, which is print. And let's take this 60 Minutes interview with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange as an example of a typical interview. There is a special set of rules in the United States for disclosing classified information. There is. There's a special, Long standing. There's, there's a special set of rules for uh, soldiers, uh, for members of the State Department uh, who are disclosing classified information. There's not a special set of rules for publishers uh, who disclose classified information. Clearly, Assange is saying that there's no special set of rules for publishers disclosing classified information, which is the argument he uses to claim that publishing leaked material is perfectly legal. Now, this is how the verbatim quote actually looks. But if I was writing a story for print, this would be too long and too cumbersome to put directly into a story. So I'd cut it down to Assange's basic point and quote him like this. The ellipse shows that I've cut some words and the parenthesis shows that I've substituted a shorter word, again without changing the meaning. If Assange saw this edited quote, he'd probably agree that it's in perfect accord with his intent and meaning. But if I was a less honest journalist working for a newspaper intent on pushing a political line, I could quite easily make a cut that changes Assange's meaning completely. And if I wanted to erase all trace of the edit I made, I wouldn't bother putting in the ellipse. This is what people would read in my newspaper, and they'd assume it's exactly what Assange said. So without knowing what the interviewee actually said, how can you spot the difference between editing that's done to save space while retaining the meaning, and dishonest editing that's done to manipulate the meaning? Well, there are lots of ways to tell from the wording, something I won't have time to go into here, but your suspicions should be aroused when an interviewee suddenly says something that completely contradicts everything he said before. For Assange to declare that publishing classified material is illegal, when for months he's been insisting it's legal, would be extraordinary. And only a journalist with a brain the size of a donut would let an admission like that slip by without pushing for more details. If Assange was doing this interview for radio, then a different technique is used. Obviously, ellipses don't work here. A long quote can simply be pieced together from bits of sentences throughout the interview. That's fine if it's done for time purposes and retains the meaning. But in unscrupulous hands, often it's not. Let's start with what Assange actually said, this time using sound editing software. There's, there's a special set of rules for uh, soldiers, uh, for members of the State Department uh, who are disclosing classified information. There's not a special set of rules for publishers uh, who disclose classified information. Now, with a bit of judicious editing, here's what we can make him say. There's, there's a special set of rules for publishers uh, who disclose classified information. The same sort of thing can be done with TV, but with television, there's a problem. If I simply take one part of Assange's quote and paste it together with another part, the sound might be seamless, but there would be an obvious jump in the picture. 
There's, there's a special set of rules for publishers uh, to disclose classified information. Now some TV networks are okay with this, and it's an honest admission that something has been cut, just like the newspaper ellipse. But if a lot of edits have to be made, as so often happens just to get a continuous sentence, and since television likes to cast an illusion that hates this kind of interruption, TV journalists have a trick to get around it. Now watch my dishonest edit again, this time the way it would be presented on a TV show. There's, there's a special set of rules for publishers. Uh, disclose classified information. To the casual viewer it looks as though Assange has continued talking without a break. This is called a cutaway or specifically a reverse. A cutaway could be anything from Assange walking in the garden to a shot of a WikiLeaks page. But the most common type of cutaway is the reverse or what Australian TV journalists call noddies because they're quick and easy and make the cut less obvious. You can go to the cutaway, do the audio edit, and then come back to the interviewee, and it sounds as though nothing has been skipped. There's, there's a special set of rules for publishers uh, to disclose classified information. But in half a second, we've changed Assange's meaning completely. These reverses happen so often in TV interviews, a passive viewer would hardly notice them. How many cuts can you see in this short clip from the 60 Minutes interview? Or what statements are you referring to? The statements uh, by, um, uh, by the Vice President, uh, Biden, saying, for instance, that I was a high-tech terrorist. Uh, Sarah Palin calling to our organization to be dealt with like the Taliban and be hunted down. There's calls either for my assassination or the assassination of my staff uh, or for us to be kidnapped uh, and renditioned uh, back to the United States to be executed. If you said three... Congratulations, you'd be wrong. There were actually six. OK, three of them were in the cutaways. The editor isn't cutting to Steve Croft here because he's reacting to something Assange said or because he's interjecting or because he's got such a pretty face we just can't get enough of it. This is an edit of the audio. But let me explain the other three. Cameras and camera crews are expensive much more so in the past when networks used to cut costs by having just one camera focused on the interviewee. The interviewer would be filmed when the interview was over. It meant he had to sit in front of the camera staring at nothing and looking interested, even repeating the same questions that were put during the interview in order to get some cutaways. But these days it's common to have two cameras and with the Assange interview a third camera was taking a wide shot allowing more variety in the way the cuts are made. Here we go from a close-up to a wide shot, and that's where something's been cut. When we go back to the close-up, that's another edit. This one is so obvious it can even be heard in the audio alone. Uh, or for us to be kidnapped uh, and renditioned uh, back to the United States to be executed. One reason for that is that an audio recording isn't consistent throughout an interview. The tone of an interviewee's voice will change, and even the quality of the recording will change as he shifts his head slightly in relation to the microphone. Or his words might be so close together that even a precise edit will push one word too close to the edit point. That's obviously the case with the sixth edit, where the camera cuts to Assange at the end of Steve Croft's question, leaving out the first part of his opening line. Or what statements are you referring to? The statements uh, by... Uh... So how would an unscrupulous journalist get around the problem of one word butting right up against another? Let's use another 60 Minutes interview, this time with a faster-talking Mark Zuckerberg, to see how this could be done. By the way, the cutaway here to Leslie Stahl isn't done to cut anything Zuckerberg said. It's a reaction shot. Without it, you'd just hear Stahl's reaction off-camera, which would sound a little weird. Now, what I'll show you in the text are the words I want to extract from the Zuckerberg interview for my fabricated quote. Well, it's funny. I mean, when I was getting started, you know, with my roommates in, in college, you never think that you could build this company or anything like that, right? Because, I mean, it's just, I mean, we were college students, right? And yeah. we were just building stuff because we, we thought it was cool. So I here's the clip I want to end up with, deleting a large chunk of what Zuckerberg said in between. Now, if we go to the audio and make the cut I want, you can see the problem. However precisely I make the cut, one word will always butt up against another. Even with the benefit of a cutaway, you can clearly hear the edit. It's funny, I mean, when I was getting started, you know, with my roommates, building stuff because we, we thought it was cool. Most ethical networks would just let that go, just as 60 Minutes did with Assange's obvious edits, because the only way to get around it is to do something that has to be regarded as deliberately deceptive.
Let's go to the Zuckerberg audio track again to see how it's done. Since the problem is that the words come too close together, I could, of course, just separate them with a fraction of a second silence, a simple pause. It's funny. I mean, when I was getting started, you know, with my roommates, building stuff because we, we thought it was cool, I do, I do... But this sounds artificial and makes the cut even more obvious. So here's the trick. Instead of silence, we copy a pause for breath from another part of the interview and simply insert it where we made the edit. Now listen to how natural that sounds. It's funny, I mean, when I was getting started, you know, with my roommates, building stuff because we, we thought it was cool, I do, I do remember having... And when we mask the audio with a cutaway, the cut is imperceptible to the casual viewer. It's funny, I mean, when I was getting started, you know, with my roommates, building stuff because we, we thought it was cool. Editing interviews and using cutaways is something every television journalist does. But every cut we make has to be weighed carefully to ensure it's done for time reasons alone and doesn't change an interviewee's intent or meaning. Which brings us back to Jesse Ventura's conspiracy program. Jesse Ventura and his team are hot on the trail of a conspiracy to use the issue of global warming to control your life. Look again at that Santa interview with a more practiced eye. Lord Moncton points to deletions from the chapter, and there were deletions from the chapter. Uh, to be consistent with the other chapters, we dropped the summary at the end. Do you see it now? That's right, the explanation Santa gave about the deletions was, ironically, itself deleted. Instead, the program goes to a cutaway, and another part of Santa's interview is inserted in its place. If we listen to the first part of the clip before the edit, it sounds as though Santa's about to explain what the deletions were. Lord Moncton points to deletions from the chapter, and there were deletions from the chapter. But, uh, and... What? We already know there were deletions, Santa said 15 years ago, that changes were made to the chapter. The controversy is about what those deletions were. But for some reason we don't get to hear the rest of Santa's sentence. It's, um, deleted. Now maybe Santa didn't go on to explain what the deletions were. But if that's the case, then why didn't the interviewer ask him? After all, that's the whole point of the interview. It's the one thing the show and its audience want to know. The result of this clever editing is that a lot of bloggers, completely oblivious to the cutaway, are quoting Santa as if this is what he actually said. And even adding things they thought he said. That's the power of television. Producers know what their target audience wants to hear, and the film can be edited accordingly. If you want to make a TV series called Quest for Lost Civilizations, for example, then you really have to give your audience lost civilizations. Now this is the point in my original video where I took a look at the TV series Quest for the Lost Civilization by Graham Hancock. It was shown on Channel 4, which seems to believe that any old nonsense should be shown on TV as long as it stirs up controversy and gets ratings. And one of the best ways to do this is to take a countercultural view and sell it like a soap product. But when I want to show how this has been done, I'm not allowed to do that because the film is copyright. That's why you can't see my original video in the UK and Ireland. But here's a brief summary using just still pictures and a bit of audio. Hancock's belief is that 12,000 years ago there was an advanced civilization stretching right around the world and that it was submerged after the last ice age. One of the places he thinks he's found this is off the island of Yonaguni in the western Pacific. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean, there's exciting evidence of a civilization that could have been lost in the cataclysm. It lies off the most southerly Japanese island of Yonaguni. It's a large rock formation sticking up just below sea level. But is it man-made? Hancock isn't an expert, he's a journalist. So for his documentary, he consulted three real experts, Egyptologist John Anthony West, geologist Dr. Robert Schoch, and geologist Professor Masaki Kimura. And when you watch the program, it appears the experts agree with Hancock that Yonaguni is largely man-made and built more than 9,000 years ago, thus supporting the idea of a lost civilization. Twelve years ago, I was asked by New Scientist to do a story on Yonaguni, and I mentioned Hancock's film in my piece. When my story was published, Hancock complained to New Scientist that it unfairly cast doubt on the conclusion of his documentary. 
But as with the videos I make on this channel, I wasn't expressing my own opinion in the New Scientist story, I simply consulted two experts. Two of the same experts that Hancock had used in his film, Robert Schock and Masaki Kimura, and I reported what they said based on their research. Kimura told me he thought it was a natural rock formation that had been worked on by humans when it rose above sea level due to tectonic uplift between five and two thousand years ago, and he sent me a review of his book giving an age of just over two thousand years based on carbon dating. Schoch thought the structure was entirely natural and that the steps and holes were erosion features. And although I didn't interview or quote John Anthony West, he had already written about the structure soon after visiting it and also concluded that it was entirely natural. So this was quite an editing feat. Hancock consulted three experts about the Yonaguni monument. One of them thought it was most likely worked on by humans a little over 2,000 years ago, and two of them thought the structure was entirely natural. Yet none of this expert opinion was conveyed to the viewer. Instead, we're led exclusively to Hancock's conclusion that Yonaguni was probably carved 12,000 years ago by a lost civilization. Its presence here suggests a very sophisticated civilization at an impossibly early date. Unfortunately, I can't show you with images and sound alone how some of the cuts were made, but I'm sure you can spot these for yourselves. Remember, you're not just listening for what's being said, you're looking to see what might have been cut. It's not that Channel 4 is worried about viewers getting free access to its programs. As I said, Quest for the Lost Civilization is freely available on YouTube, apparently with Channel 4's and Hancock's blessing. It's just that no one is allowed to use clips to critique the program. As I learned from my experience with the New Scientist story, Hancock is very touchy about any criticism of his lost civilization fantasy. If we dare show how he ignored expert opinion to sell his program, heavens, people might start thinking there is no lost civilization, and what would happen to all those books? If I ask people whether they trust what they see on television, I usually get a resounding no. Everyone seems to know that most television programs are in the business of entertainment. Everyone knows TV producers can make you think you've seen something that never happened or heard something that wasn't said. Yes, we all know it, but boy, we still fall for it.